Our scripture reading this morning will come from 1 John 4, 4 through 6. 1 John 4, 4 through 6. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Well, good to see everybody here today. I hope you have your Bibles. <clears throat> and I want you to have them open to the book of 1 John, please. This is where we'll take most of our thoughts from this morning. We are, we've been working our way through the book of 1 John and looking at things dealing with certainty and I guess you would say confidence too. That the word no, as I've pointed out throughout this series of lessons, K-N-O-W is used 40 times in these five chapters. And, there's, and so there's something to that. There are things that we can know, and we've talked about a lot of different things throughout this series. We can know that we're going to heaven. We can know that Jesus is the Son of God and that He came in the flesh. Uh, we can know that God hears and answers our prayers. So many things that we are assured of in the book of 1 John. And I suppose today will be the last in this series of lessons, and we're going to talk today about the fact that we can know truth and error. And it was kind of interesting because our the young adults class that we have in the fellowship hall, I would say in a way, kind of touched on this today as we were talking about being able to discuss the Bible and different biblical questions with family and friends and co-workers and difficult situations that you might find yourself in in those types of discussions. Questions and objections that might come up and, and uh, how do we handle those situations? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is just this. We can know truth and we can know error. It's hard, I would say, to an extent. I don't know if it was harder, if it's harder now, if it was harder in the first century. And I, I don't know that you can even fairly draw that comparison, but the fact of the matter is we live in what's called the postmodern world. Modernism dealt more with, let's say in the secular realm, fact, science, knowledge, things like this. Whereas postmodernism, which this is the age that you and I live in, and really <clears throat> when you look at our specific culture, you go back into the 1950s and 60s and you see this shift from modernism to into what we are now fully postmodernism. I mean, this is why today in our world, people don't know what gender they are. And they struggle with that. And this is why in our world today that, that mathematics is called racist and based on white colonialism. It's, it's, it's postmodernism is a, a highly emotional, highly emotionally charged. Um, my truth is just as good as your truth frame of mind. And that's hard to deal with. When you get into Bible discussions with folks who have that frame of mind, I don't know how far you're going to get. It's hard because to, the, to, to many of these people in our world, there is no such thing as an absolute objective standard of truth. Because your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And, and we can't judge each other and we cannot tell each other that we are wrong. We just have to, as we hear sometimes say, agree to disagree. That's kind of postmodernism in a shell, in a nutshell, as we say. But as we turn to the pages of Scripture, we are told, and, and that's another thing before I get into that. That's another thing that... Attitude is even within the Lord's church, sadly, that we cannot draw lines of fellowship. We can't draw lines of right and wrong, that we have to be more tolerant and more accepting. It's like during the post-enlightenment movement, again, that we find ourselves in the middle of, everybody is um, so much more enlightened than anybody in history. They know so much more and they know so much better. But really what it comes down to is well, I know what I want to know, and you know what you want to know, and that's, and that's good enough for all of us. And that's not the nature of truth. When you look at the definition of truth, it has to do with that which is tied to reality. All right? We need to understand that. 
Truth is that which is real. And there are things that are real and things that are right. And there are things that are real and that, and that are wrong. And we can know the difference. We can know truth from error and we can know truth and error. So, and that's, that's saying it a couple of different ways. We can identify truth from error, but we can also know both. So that's what I want us to talk about this morning. So as you flip through this little book of 1 John, again, five chapters, and within these five chapters, an average of eight times per chapter, we see this word truth. Here's what we know. We can do it not, John tells us. If you look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6, if we, say that we have no, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And John talks a lot about doing things. And it, it has the idea of practicing these things. If you um, walk in darkness, if you're not walking in the revelation of God's will, which you go down to verse 7, walk in the light, then you're in the dark and you are doing not the truth. That's, that's distinguishable. You can tell when you are doing what's right, what's true, and when you're doing what's wrong, or that is what's an error. The truth can fail to be in us. You look at chapter 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. We can know the truth. You look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 21. I have, written, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. He's reaffirming what they already knew. We'll come back to chapter 2 at the end of the lesson. There's some interesting stuff there. No lie is of the truth. So there is no, listen, there is no agreeing to disagree when it comes to truth and error. And you, you name the biblical subject. If there's truth on it and there's error on it, there is no agreeing to disagree. You're either in the truth or you're not. And, and you know, in our age... In our historical context, that's not nice. I mean, you're just not nice. If you say something like that, you're, you're judgmental and you're harsh and you're not accepting and you're intolerant. You know, all the names that uh, people will throw at you, bigoted, all the catchphrases of the postmodern age. But no lie is of the truth. Our love is said to be in truth. Let us love not in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 3, 18, and that means you do it. Biblical, biblical love, just like biblical faith, is always active. It always does something. It's always, well, like we talked about last week, God manifested His love toward us. And He bestowed His love upon us, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. It's visible because it's active. Our love is to be active, or that is, in truth. And remember, so if the word truth is that which is tied to reality, our love is to be in reality. And you know, James talks about that in James chapter 2. Um, if you have a brother or sister who is in need and destitute of daily food and clothing, and you say, you know, good luck, be warmed and filled, what good is that? That's not loving, and that's not love in truth and love in reality. You do something about it. And then from our scripture reading, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6, we can know the spirit of of truth. So here's what we're going to do. Have your Bibles open there to 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to dissect this passage, verses 1 through 6, and learn what we can while we're here together this morning about knowing truth and error. So what I've done, I've got seven points that I want us to break down here, and uh, the first three points are just coming from verse 1. So let's talk about it. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So your first question might be, well, what are the spirits? What does that mean? That's a weird word. Well, the end of that verse tells you. You try the spirits because there are false prophets. The false prophets are the spirits. Uh, th these aren't invisible beings, ghosts floating around or anything like that. These are people who are propagating false doctrine. And when you read for one of the, well, the doctrine, that false doctrine that John's talking about here. If you look down at verse 3, the false doctrine is those who do not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And we address that in this series. That was one of the problems that, problems that they were dealing with in the first century. It was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism said the flesh is evil, the spirit's good. And so they looked at Jesus, fleshly, and Christ, spiritually, as two different um, entities. And how could they cross? If the flesh is evil and the spirit's good... How then could Jesus be the Christ? 
So that's what we're talking about here. Um, we need to understand that first. But first John and knowing truth. First of all, don't believe every spirit. I mean, th this is written in the first century while apostles are walking around on the earth. While Jesus himself was walking around on the earth. Didn't he tell us about false prophets? You go back to Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Uh, By their fruits you will know them. Outwardly they appear good, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There were false prophets then. I mean, you can even go back to the Old Testament and find false prophets. And so don't believe every spirit. There are those who would mislead you. Secondly, also from verse 1, what do you do since that is the case? Well, you test the spirits or uh, the, the King James says, try the spirits. The New King James says, test that you put them to the test. So if you take your Bibles, for instance, we're not going to do this. You can write it down if you take notes. But you go back to Deuteronomy 18 and you read verses 18 through 20 and you have the test of a prophet there. And the test of a prophet is if he speaks a word and he claims it's from me, from God, and that word comes not to pass, you can know that he's a false prophet. Well, that same Standard applies to us today. You can listen to somebody speak in the name of God and you can compare it to what's already been given. And if it doesn't match up, you know they're not from God. They're a that's, that's what it means then to test the spirits. So take your Bibles real quick to keep your finger here in 1 John. Let's go back to Acts chapter 17 real quick. And I suppose this is a passage you're all familiar with. We typically read Acts 17 and verse 11, but I want us to read verses 10 through 12 together and see this point here, test the spirits in action. Acts 17, 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now we know what Paul did when he went into the synagogue. He taught, didn't he? And he preached from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, anyway, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. So they listened, but then they tested the spirits. Look at this phrase. And searched the scriptures daily. And hopefully if you have heard me over the last seven and a half years, you've heard me say, don't take my word for it. I'm not the standard of truth and no preacher is. You test you compare it to Scripture. And if it matches up, okay, so be it. If not, then we need to do something about that, don't we? So that's what it means to test the spirits. Now notice what happens. They search the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. But look at verse 12. Therefore, in other words, because the Bereans took the time to not only listen, but to search it out, many of them believed. You present them with the Word of God. You present the evidence and if they're of, as it says here in verse 11, noble, I think the New King James maybe says fair-minded. But anyway, if they're fair, equitable, let's say, they'll test. And if it matches up, that's good. And many of them believed. That's what it means to test the spirits. Don't believe everybody. Test them. And then the third thing that comes out to me from verse 1, back to 1 John chapter 4 now, is... Acknowledge that they exist. Okay, so again, that's a hard thing to do in our modern society because living in the postmodern age, you can't do that. You can't tell people they're wrong. You can't judge. I mean, that's, I suppose people have been saying that forever, but we have to judge. We're commanded to judge. We are told to be able to discern um, Hebrews 5 and verse 14 discern between good and evil. And that word discern means to judge through, to look at a situation and judge it. Jesus tells us in John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Well, how do you do that? Don't believe everything you hear and test it. Test it when you do hear it. Test it with the word of God. But you have to be willing to acknowledge that false prophets exist. Again, you know, Jesus talks about it and there are so many passages, I mean, we find it throughout the book of Acts as Paul's making his journeys, uh, false teachers, particularly an example would be like Acts chapter 15. Uh, Romans, I tell you what, look, let's look at that one real quick. Turn over to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. 
If a person's not willing to acknowledge that there is such a thing as error or that there is such a thing as false prophets, then they'll, they'll fall for anything, really. Look at Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. That word mark means you, you identify who they are, acknowledge them. You point it out that cause or which cause divisions and offenses, offenses contrary to the doctrines you have learned and, and do what? Avoid them. Well, <laughs> that can only mean one thing. You avoid them. You recognize who they are. You note that and avoid them. Why? For they that are such, okay, they cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Those who do that kind of thing, they're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. That word simple in the Greek there means the unsuspecting. Well, guess what? If you don't study your scriptures, you can be one of the unsuspecting ones. And so can I. That's why we have to not believe everybody and put them to the test and acknowledge that they're real. But there's a standard. There's a test that you have to give when you hear someone speaking in the, uh, let's say, in the name of God. So that's, that's just from verse 1, those three points. Number four, you have to ask yourself a question in regard to truth and error. What is this person teaching? All right, what are they laying out in front of me? So look at verses two and three. Hereby know, know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And like I told you earlier, that's the um, very specific doctrine that John is dealing with in this book. Did Jesus as the Christ come in the flesh? Was he human and divine? You know, what was his, uh, what was his essence? Well, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. First John, if I'm not mistaken, first John is the only book that uses the word Antichrist. And we're told exactly who he is. Where have you have heard that it should come? Look at this. And even now already it is in the world. The Antichrist was in the world 2,000 years ago. And it's interesting. And to me, that just, it, it perfectly shows what I'm saying here and what John's writing to us. There are still people today who are looking for an Antichrist to come. John was writing about him in the first century. The Antichrist is here. In fact, he says, um, as he'll tell us, there, there are many antichrists, and that's back in chapter 2. It's not one person, as some would have us believe. You know, a, a lot of people believed it was Adolf Hitler back in the early 1900s. He's the antichrist. No, he, well, he was against Christ, and that's all that word means, but he wasn't the antichrist. The antichrist was one who denied that Jesus Christ was in the flesh. So, well, what does that mean to me? You may not be dealing with that specific question. You may be having a discussion with someone, again, maybe a co-worker, family member, whatever the case may be, in terms of religion. What are they confessing? What beliefs do they hold to? Can you test what, and, and are you testing what they say with what Scripture reveals? You have to know those things. Again, when, when you look at that word back in Romans 16 and verse 18, deceiving the hearts of the simple, that word means the unsuspecting. You, it, being ignorant, let's say. What is each confessing? That's what we have to ask. Number five, and this is, I mean, it kind of reiterates everything we're already saying here, but false spirits, false prophets, as he says at the end of verse one here, are identifiable. So verse five, they are of the world. They speak of the world. And the world heareth them. The truth, you know, and Jesus even tells us this, doesn't he? The truth is narrow, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to life, and few there be that, you know, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. When I look here about these false prophets, the world's willing to listen to them. So think about this for just a minute. Why do you suppose you can turn on your television on a Sunday morning and find a televangelist who their auditorium looks like a it looks like a football stadium and it's packed. 
How does that happen? Listen to their message. And the message is often, you know, if you, uh, if you, send, our, if you send our ministry some money, you're going to be blessed. You're going to receive money. And you're going to have the health you want. And you can be all that God planned for you to be. And you'll be successful at work. And well, the world loves that. The world loves self-help and self-improvement and that kind of thing. But you get down to the nuts and bolts of truth and error and that crowd will shrink quickly. False spirits, false spirits are identifiable. They speak like the world speaks. They don't speak like scriptures, you know, like the scripture. And we're told, Christians are told, you look at a passage like 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. If any man speak... Let him speak as the oracles of God. And the oracle, the word oracle, it's, it's the writings, the sacred writings. So when it comes to God's word, we need to speak as the sacred writings speak. We speak as the world. Uh, we'll have a full house. But you identify truth versus error and you expose false teachers for what they are. That's not popular. And again, especially in our in our uh, day and age. Let's do this real quick. Turn over to Matthew chapter 16, please. And Jesus talks about this. And to me, that's another thing that's always important to remember. You hear about maybe, maybe false teachers outside of Christ. You know, they're not members of the body of Christ and they're teaching error. But then you hear it coming from within the churches of Christ. And that's truly disturbing. But it's not new. It's been going on for 2,000 years, folks. Matthew 16, the end of Matthew 15 has Jesus feeding the 4,000. And then you open to Matthew 16 and it says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came tempting him. Give us a sign. <laughs> Matthew 15 is full of signs and they, wanna, they want further signs. Well, you're not getting a sign. And then he tells his disciples, look at this, verse uh, five, his disciples were come to the other side. They had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're, they're thinking, uh oh, we forgot food. And that's not what he was talking about at all. You read beginning down at verse seven and it continues down through there. But look at verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread? OK, the physical, the food. That ye should be, aware, but that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they. He was telling them about their doctrine. See, leaven is an influencing agent, and it affects everything that it's put in, and that's what he's talking about. You better watch out for their doctrine. False spirits are identifiable, and if you're like the Bereans, as we say often from Acts chapter seventeen, where you know your scriptures. You can identify a false teacher. And, and I've even been in situations myself where I'll hear something and, and it's like I'm sitting there and th that just something's not right here. And the longer you listen, it, there it is. It, it comes out. That shows us the importance of knowing Scripture. You know, and just as an example, then we'll move on to the next point. When Jesus was tempted... Uh, this is a great example. Every time Jesus was tempted, what were the first three words out of his mouth? It is written. And that needs to be us. We need to be able to identify things that are contrary to the word of God. You can know truth and error. Number six from verse. Now back to first John chapter four. Look at verse six. We are of God. So the false spirits are of the world and they speak like the world. and The world hears them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. And that's what I was saying. You, you speak um, popularly and no negative, no condemnation, no judgment. People will listen to you. They'll hear you. But if you speak like God speaks, they won't listen. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So I thought about that. And well, we need to hear the apostles. This is an apostle writing. And he says, he that hears us. Well, that's. That's where, that's where it is. Uh, he that knoweth God, he'll listen to us. The sad reality is, is that a lot of people don't know 
the God of the Bible and they don't know the Bible. And so when they hear someone speaking religiously, maybe it's a man up front and he's holding a Bible in his hand. Well, you know, well, surely he's not lying to us. Test the spirits that you can identify them. And are they teaching what the apostles taught? So let's think about that for just a minute. Take your Bibles to John chapter 16 with me, please. And as you're turning there, John 16, uh, after the church was established there in Acts chapter 2, one of the things that's said, and this is Acts 2 and verse 42, it says of those early Christians, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, what does that mean? I thought we were supposed to listen to Jesus. All right. Look at John chapter 16, verse 13. Well, let's start in verse 12. John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And he says that because this is just a matter of hours before he dies uh, and is buried. You can't handle them now, and, and frankly, he doesn't have the time. How be it? In other, in other words, however, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. I want to tell you something. Let me finish reading this verse, and I'm going to tell you something. He shall guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you, apostles, things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. This, is the, this, this setting is the, the, um, the Last Supper, as we say, right before Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper. That, that's all this context here. Look what it says there in verse 13 again. When the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So you guys know, and I've, I've told you this before, when I, I come to the office eight-ish, a little before eight every morning, and one of the first things I do is I sit down and I listen to a sermon or I listen to a podcast for 20, 30 minutes, sometimes a little longer. I was listening to one the other day and this guy was talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, he starts referencing John chapters 14, 15, and 16. He's talking about how the Holy Spirit helps the Christian. And he says, essentially, when you don't understand the scriptures, the Holy Spirit will tell you what they mean. And then he quoted John 16, 13. He said, he will guide you into all truth. So let's think about that for just a minute. Are there portions of scripture that you don't understand? There are passages that are difficult to understand. We know that. But maybe there's something you've thought about that maybe you're working your way through, let's say. You're studying and learning According to this guy, all you have to do is pray to the Holy Spirit and he will teach you all things. You'll know it all. And he also quoted, if you look back to John chapter 14, look at John 14 in verse 26. He says, the comfort, this is Jesus, the comforter who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He also quoted that verse and said, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit will do for you. But look at the rest of John 14, 26. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Let me ask you a question. What has Jesus ever said to you personally? Has he audibly spoken in your ear and told you something that you didn't understand? Well, of course not. But that's we need to hear the apostles and false spirits are identifiable. And when we have people telling us that, well, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth... Number one, they're taking that passage completely out of its context. And number two, you should never not know anything. Because you'll be guided into all truth. You should never have a Bible question ever. Because the Holy Spirit's guiding you into all truth. That's what it says. So, let me tell you something. False spirits are identifiable. You can hear that. That was identifiable. We need to listen to the apostles. My point in going to John chapter 16 was... Jesus told the apostles, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth. That's why I'm saying that. The apostles taught just exactly what Jesus taught because they were guided by the Holy Spirit he, that he said, whom the Father will send when I leave here. Listen to the apostles' doctrine. That's what the early church did. All right, number seven. And this one's a bit longer and this is where we'll wrap it up. And let's go to 1 John chapter 2 for this one. While the first century Christians had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and can't spend a great deal of time, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the spiritual gifts. Um, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 8 through 11 lists the nine spiritual gifts. 
that, that existed. And we are told in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11 that the Holy Spirit distributed those gifts as He willed. It's not up to you to find some spiritual gift. It's not what The Bible never says that. It tells us that the Holy Spirit distributed those gifts as He willed. And not every Christian had spiritual gifts. I mean, all of these facts come out as you read Scripture and learn this subject. So, while the first century Christians had the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, we have the written revelation to identify those false spirits. How would we even know that there is such a thing as false spirits if you didn't have the Word of God? Because it tells us about them. Old, Old Testament tells us about false prophets, and so does the New Testament. So you go to 1 John chapter 2, and this is what I want to look at for just a minute. There's a word, and it depends on what... If, if you're looking at a King James Version, you'll see this word unction. Interesting word. If you're looking at a New King James, you see this word anointing, and that's what this word is. In the original, the word is charisma. Listen to that. Charisma. Charismatic. Spiritual gifts. That's what we're dealing with here. There, there are religious movements that are called charismatic movements. Pentecostal movements, um, holiness, assembly of God, things like that that are charismatic. John tells these people here that they had a charisma. They had spiritual gifts. Now look at 1 John 2 and verse, verse 20. Let's start here. Talking to these Christians, he says, But ye have an unction. The word means anointing. If you take notes, write that out in the margin of your Bible. You have an anointing from the Holy One. Look, and ye know all things. One of the spiritual gifts that, were given by the Holy, that was given by the Holy Spirit was the gift of knowledge, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And if you had the gift of knowledge, you knew things that other people didn't know. Well, they had that gift, obviously. I've not, and, and that's where he continues here. I've not written unto you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Um, you keep reading, get down to verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received from him abideth in you. It stays in you, this gift, this charisma. And ye need not that any man teach you. Think about this for just a minute. Remember when the Ethiopian eunuch was, was um, traveling in his chariot and Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? What did he say? Well, how can I unless some man guide me? These people that John was writing to, again, look at chapter 2 and verse 27. You don't need that any man teach you. Why? Because verse 20. They had a spiritual gift, and the spiritual gift was that of knowledge. They knew all things. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie... And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. They had the spiritual gifts, and it was a knowledge, but they still had to abide in him. They still had to stay there. Now, we don't have those spiritual gifts today. Those things came to an end, and the New Testament talks about that rather extensively. But we have the product of those spiritual gifts. Men that wrote those things down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, so we're reading 1 John. John was an apostle. And John was one of those men who on the day of Pentecost received the Holy Spirit, was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that gift was with him and with the other apostles. So that's why number six is important here. We need to hear the apostles. And we have their written revelation. It was revealed to them from God by the Holy Spirit and they wrote it down. We have that revelation. And so we can identify false spirits. To me, that's hopeful. You guys know just as well as I do that you can go to any, um, any church building, any religious gathering, and you'll hear all sorts of different and conflicting messages on any number of subjects. You'll walk into some church buildings and the stage up front will look just like that. It'll look like some massive concert production getting ready to happen. Every type of instrument you can name, lights. I've even seen fog machines employed. To, I don't know what purpose that serves, but it's like you're going to a concert somewhere. And then you'll come to a place like this and people will say, well, where's the piano? And so you have these conflicting and confusing messages, but you have the Word of God. And you can identify things that are true 
but you can also identify things that are in error. And that's our responsibility. That's, that's each of our responsibilities. You can't depend on one man. You can't depend on me. You have to develop your own faith. You have to develop your own knowledge. And we can help each other in that. I mean, that's, listen. Why do you think the church offers Bible class? And do you take advantage of it? We're trying to help people grow here. And, and we need to put forth our best effort to be here and to be involved in that um, study of God's word. But here's what it comes down to. We can know truth and error. And you can know that you're right. And that's not arrogant. It's not conceited. But you can also know if you're wrong. And maybe there's something you need to change. Maybe there's something I need to change. Let Scripture reveal that to you. But you've got to be in Scripture. It may be the case that there's somebody here this morning who maybe you know that you're not right. It may be the case that you know what you need to do in order to obey the gospel, in order to have your sins washed away, but maybe you just have not done that yet. Listen, Scripture reveals what it takes for you to have your sins washed away. Remember, Saul of Tarsus spent three days and nights in prayer and fasting, and when Ananias got there, he said, What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. He had to get up and do something, and so do we. So maybe you need to do that. Maybe you have questions about that. Don't hesitate to ask those questions. We'll be happy to answer them for you with, with the Scriptures. Maybe you're here this morning and you've obeyed the Gospel in the past, but perhaps you've not remained faithful to the Gospel and to God. Well, let's change that today. Maybe it's something you need to deal with through prayer and through repentance. Maybe it's something more public and you need to come before the church and, as James 5.16 says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. We're giving you that opportunity now. If you need to respond to the gospel, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.